Hello, everybody. This morning is November 9th, 2019, and we welcome you to our Bible study. Thank you all for joining us. We are recording today from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And we welcome you all. Our moderator today is Thomas from New York. Good morning. Uh, so our uh, text that we're leading off today, I'll read that. Uh, I would ask that all Christians unite in prayer for the cessation of sin, the oppression of the weak, the accession of power at the sacrifice of individual rights, and especially that divine love shield the innocent from the wrath of the guilty and cause it to praise love. That's from Divinity Course and General Collectania, the blue book by Mary Baker Eddy, page 69. Amen. That's very powerful. Yes. Yes. Who picked this one? That was me, Linda. Thank you. You're welcome. What do you want to add to this? Well, I, I just thought it was a beautiful prayer that is not about person or personality, but principle. And that's what we're talking about in our Bible studies. We're not pointing out people, but types of thinking and thought and how to pray about it. That's what it meant to me. That's wonderful. Very Thank nice. you very, very much. Yes. That's why Amos is a good example. A good chapter. And, you know, this idea of, of shielding the innocent is so important. This is a huge and sobering responsibility we as, as scientists take on. There are those maliciously working, but there's so many innocents. And in our watches, in our daily prayers, we must always be shielding them. I think about it when, I, when I'm around, when I walk down the streets. I, you see the children, the innocent people all over the world. It must always be included in our work. Error will punish itself, but the innocence, innocent must be protected. Lawrence? Yeah, I was thinking about this very much this week um, in relation to children and where most children are today most of the day because parents have to work. And it just struck me that how important it is for that many hours, sometimes for I guess eight hours, a child is in daycare or something, and who is there you know, guiding them, whoever is there, their thinking has to have an impact on this, these little children. So just to be very aware, to, to really pray for all of them every day. Um, I mean, they're exposed to so much, but the little innocent children, whatever their teacher says means a lot, so... Pray for all those teachers everywhere. Um, Thank you. Beautiful and so important. Shardy and Linda, a while ago, we had a watch on that, which I have kept in my Bible to work with really every morning, that the influence is all divine um, because they are getting it. They're getting all kinds of influences. And as they grow older in the textbooks and other things, erroneous influence. But if you, if you are... If you bring up a child in the way, he will, he will be obedient. Yeah, he will follow it. But the, the prayerful work needs to be done. Mrs. Evans used to feel very strongly that these daycare centers and everything, it, it was communist. You send your babies off to daycare, <laughs> and you don't know who's influencing them. And that's also a very sobering thought. Um, so, yes, we have to counteract and and do that work because now most women have to work and many many children are put into daycare including you know our own our own grandchildren so and and the the enemy would love to infiltrate our schools 
in our daycare centers. They would love to. So we need to protect them. And the power of prayer is a mighty power. And we all can be thinking all day, so let's be thinking rightly. And I know, certainly in the early morning hours, I pray this way. And for all children everywhere, and certainly if you have any children going to school or grandchildren or friends or neighbors or anything, we pray for them. And shield the innocent. And that watch... Maybe you can put it on the carousel or something. It was a very excellent watch on this. Thank you very much, Florence. A very important point. And that word of oppression, since it's in this Bible study, looking at uh, oppress, to load or burden with unreasonable impositions, to treat with unjust severity, rigor, or hardship. It's not just some little thing, oppression. And to an extent, we all are oppressed some way. Thank you. Whatever the, that incessant error keeps on talking, 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 no matter how much you try to pray, it's an oppression. We all oppressed, I feel, in some way. Well, that's a very good point. All error is an oppression if we allow it. The, the oppression of the human mind, and it, it will accuse you day and night if you let it. And it's always unreasonable. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Eddy speaks to that in Science and Health. First, the, the freedom of the oppression of the slaves, but she says there's a greater oppression, and that's the human mind. And, of course, that had led to the oppression of the slaves, any kind of oppression. The human mind is behind it. We have learned here, the human mind is a killer. There is not one good thing about it. Because all it can do is destroy itself. So that's why the importance of staying out of the human mind and the human beliefs that are prevalent. I would say that... Uh we were very fortunate in this country to grow up in a time with such a grand effect of Mary Baker Eddy's work <clears throat> because for a mother to stay home and uh, take care of the kids is not the norm even today. And I mean, okay, even back then around the world. Uh, so if one lives in a place where water is 10 miles away, I mean, they sent the kids at 10 miles, and that was their day. Their day was to go fetch the water or do whatever chore or whatever. Thank and you. uh, You're right. We are very fortunate to live in a country that gave birth to Christian science. That is the purpose of our nation, of our country. It was interesting because in speaking with Parth Parthens recently, he, he, I mean, certainly that was the main reason of our country to give birth to Christian science. But he also said, Parthens said that um, our country was formed also to. An example to the world. Evangelize. Yes, evangelize the world to Christianity. Christ Christianity. Yes, Christ Christianity, not just old be, theology. Yeah, I mean, we have a responsibility, don't we, to the rest of the world to be the best example that we can be of Christ's Christianity in practice. Mm -hmm. And he also said, and in thinking about it, I mean, I think this is to be true, that the tremendous wealth that our country had and still does have, what would be the purpose? Why did why were we given it by God to do what? To set an example for the rest of the world. Yes, and to reach out. With it. Mm -hmm. Yes, to reach out with it. Not to hoard it or to, you know, get fat and happy with it. 
but to give it out and, and bless and Christian as a Christian. Christian as I. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Christianization. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Get it out there to, to everybody for this freedom of the human mind. Get our textbook out. Get it out. And that's truly what our church stands for and what our website stands for, for that. And that's where our money goes. This is one of the big things that I found very impressive about the, that movie, Harriet, about Harriet Tubman. You know, she found her way to freedom. And it, after about a year, she just couldn't even stand it. She had to go back and, and start helping getting people. And Thank you. On her own, she, she freed like 70 slaves. And then she led some troop in, and they saved like 750 or something like that. (laughs) Thank you. Yes, I was praying about when to talk about that movie. And with today's topic, it goes directly to the topic. Because talk about being oppressed, the slaves in the South, and, well, and their willfulness to refuse to give it up, but with God, because she, she had such a sense of God, she was able to escape herself, walk a hundred miles. A, a minister told her to follow the North Star. And if she couldn't see the star, to follow the, the river. And if she couldn't see the river, to hear, listen for it. And, and under tremendous odds. I mean, there's no way, truly, and, that she could have done that without God and people trying to find her and furious that she escaped and then she goes back and does it several times more I mean I was on the edge of my seat the whole movie I kept saying Gary there's no way she's going to get out of this one (laughs) (laughs) and she did nothing possible to God (laughs) God did God (laughs) did and then when someone tried to tell her what to do? She said, don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> said, God tells me what to do. You don't know what, you don't know who I am or what I've been through. And uh, every, every turn she, she followed God and she would have visions as to what to do and where the enemy was. Her name, her original name, the name her mother gave her was Aram, Araminta, which I never heard of. I guess it's an Hebrew name. And they called her Minty, but Araminta means prayer or protection. And so I felt strongly that her mother had prayed over her. And there's another movie I I bought that I want to see, a CD with Cicely Tyson called, I believe it's called A Woman Called Moses. And in uh, in the movie, they said she was the Moses for her people. And she was. And I do think she should be on a whatever the $20 bill <laughs> after seeing that that's where my vote is absolutely because at first it was just just <laughs> going the 100 miles from down south to Pennsylvania but then uh, Congress passed a law that free um, yeah. slaves could be taken back so then she had to bring them all the way to Canada so uh-huh. <laughs> It's a wonderful movie. It was. And her love and persistence and her, her faith in God was just so inspiring. And in talking to Florence about it, that's what she translated it back to spiritual terms as being, yes, we're all under this oppression, how aggressive it can be. And uh, you have to fight your way free of it. The same message from Amos here. No wonder that Martin Luther King referenced that statement, let justice flow like a river. Mm -hmm. Yes. It also showed the the slave, her slave owners that had been cruel were greatly oppressed themselves. Yeah, they were caught in the system. The error came back on them. The error, they wouldn't let it go. Their so. error came back on them. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. So, but all of this, it was good of Florence, you know, to impersonalize. As Linda said in the very start, we impersonalize. These are types of error, types of mortal mind, and type that re- represent the Christ. Mm-hmm. It's not 
try to keep it out of personal sense. That's helpful. So we don't get angry. But I mean, you know, so how ironic it is that uh, the slave owner thinking that they're free, they're this, but they're so <laughs> into the sense of I depend on these slaves to live. Uh, yep. And when they're not there, oh, gosh, you know, everything is over. So in a way, they're enslaved too, and uh, they're not recognizing it. Because when the slaves were gone, look at the desperation. Uh, so what were you depending on? Exactly. Only God never le- changes, so. Yes. Yeah. So I'll tell you a story about uh, dependency. Uh, my uh, my ancestor, when he was born, his father died. So uh, when he was growing up as a young boy, he had to go out and, and work. And, uh, cause, uh, you know, there was just a mother and I think about four kids. So struggling. And... Uh, uh, he didn't earn very much. It was like a penny a day or something like that. But there, it's like when he was 12, there was a black man who, uh, a farmer nearby that gave him a job, paid him double what he was getting, which helped the family, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, then when the Civil War broke out, his, uh, his brother joined the Confederacy, but... Uh, he said that because of the black farmer who gave him a job, he's going to join the union, even though his brother joined the Confederacy. Wow. Hmm. And, and I think really all this proves that it's not, it has nothing to do with color or anything like that. What is that conscience that knows what to do or will do right by God? That's all. Because even in Harriet, you had the, Uh, Along the way, there were uh, white people who had houses that would help her. Um, So it's got nothing to do with color, really. Uh, Or party. I mean, the Republican, Democrat, all this. I think it has to do with conscience. Yes. Exactly. Well, I think that's perfect because it's not really uh, uh, a race or ethnicity or country of origin, but uh, it's your thinking, mm-hmm. you know? It's where, you, it's where your heart is. And and it was interesting because everyone who did right and everyone that was protected, they were all faith-based. They all believed in God. Mm-hmm. And that's that was the difference all the way through. And one thing I was so grateful about the movie was because now today, Hollywood often, I understand that, movie Unbroken never really mentioned was a, a man who was taken a prisoner of war but and s- survived it but they never mentioned how God fearing he was they kept that part of it out although if you read the book it's in the book but this movie was full of God and that was what made it so powerful so um all we're talking about, I just I mentioned one thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I <clears throat> remember this the second morning waking up after seeing the movie. Um, she she was getting some grief for wanting to go back to help. And she said, it may be God. It may be God that's speaking to me, but it's still my own feet that that's doing the walking. And that really just struck me that, it, you know, we it's a, it's not just wishful thinking. It's not just thinking good thoughts. You got to get out there and do something. And I, she realized that. So it's just really she? impressive. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, there, uh, so um, go ahead. I was going to say another uh, world famous reformer, Gandhi, struggled to understand how some people could feel honor and superiority or pleasure in such inhumane practices as were being used against him by the uh, white uh, colonialists. And uh, the interesting thing is is that he had a a great, great respect and uh, following of uh, Jesus' teachings and uh, really uh, had the utmost respect for uh, regardless of race, whatever, Everybody and it, and it evolved because at one point he was uh, defending the Indians in South Africa because he didn't want them to be 
lowered the level of the native Africans, but uh, that evolved to an understanding where everybody was uh, equal, and then he defended all uh, races, and he actually organized stretcher bearers in the war against uh, between the British and the natives, and they tried to uh, help both sides, uh, but were prevented from uh, by the British Army of helping the uh, natives. Okay. And okay. Anybody? All right. Well, I wanted to read uh, what was in our reading. Um, this is where we've been uh, uh, very, very fascinating talking about really question five here about pressing the poor. So one of our readings is from Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 14, uh, verse 31. He that oppresseth the poor reproach, reproacheth his maker, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. I don't know if this is a good time, but I kind of wanted to revisit some of what was going on in Israel, and I don't remember if we've done this already, but when uh, Amos was preaching, he went up to the northern kingdom, which we mentioned, and at the time, in the southern kingdom, I believe it was King Uzziah, who was known to be a good king, but up in the north, Jeroboam, Jeroboam had been king, and at the time, and then it was Jeroboam too, but they were not related when Amos was there. But the original Jeroboam, who had worked under King Solomon, had been promised that if he followed God and listened to God, he would be blessed. But he chose not to do that and started to lead that area, which Amos was preaching against, into heavy idolatry. And in it, he put up two golden calves uh, and made the priests celebrate them. And they even refer to this specific idolatry as the sin of Jeroboam in uh, chapters King 1 and 2. And I guess he lasted for about 22 years. But he led this kingdom into sin. And apparently all of the uh, uh, following him, the different kings continued this as well. So this is what Amos is addressing. And uh, it was interesting, one of the things... I came across in a commentary was they used the word drunk on their own economic excess, intent on strengthening their financial position, but they, there was no God in it. And I found that probably the most interesting thing this time when I was preparing was I kept coming across all these kings and the difference between the ones who chose to uphold and follow principles of God and those who did not, and the consistent ending of both. Uh, there's no gray, line, gray area. If you followed God, it, it ended well. And even though there was prosperity, it did not end well for the northern kingdom. And then uh, I do believe Spurgeon also refers to, I'm going to see if I can find it, makes a comment. Uh, he says, I can hardly, uh, he quotes someone who says, I can hardly understand your being at ease and self-righteousness. And uh, there was a lot of um, this word ease that kept coming up. And it really made me think because that's a very sneaky trap of, I think, the human mind, this desire for ease. But I do also believe all this idolatry led them into all, all these uh, behaviors that we're going to address in the Bible study. It's not that those were specific, those were the outcomes of idolatry, which was really the true sin. But that's all I have to add for now. Thank you. Well, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so much of what's in Amos. I mean, like you said, when uh, the uh, kingdom split and the northern kingdom went its own way, they were very strong militarily. Uh, they were very strong economically. And um, they felt like they had to set up their new religion. So like you said, they in Bethel and Dan, they 
put up these uh, golden calves and worship them. And then you're talking about how then that led into, you know, a life of ease. And it's interesting how all this kind of seems relevant today, you know what I mean? So. Okay, very much. Very much so. I think that goes back to what was said in the beginning about oppressing the poor, because uh, how do you qualify prosperity? Does this prosperity mean that there's five billionaires running everything, or does it mean that everybody is sharing in the wealth? It also had to do with what the people were doing with their prosperity, because there were very godly kings who did right by the prosperity. That that and that's the point, exactly. That's all you should do with it. I mean, if you recognize that God gave you, then you would do. You know, you have to do right with it. And uh, Tom, what you just Thomas, what you just read in the Proverbs about uh, the poor, he that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker. That reproach means to treat with contempt, God. So it ought to give. As pause to do what's not of God. Yeah, who was saying that they couldn't believe? Who, who could have that kind of mentality? But I guess when your whole economic system is based on it, and that's how your family was, you know, it's just handed down. Um, you, you don't question that brutality of slavery, but it is kind of a wonder how they could. And yeah, they get they'll they'll whatever's but met against one, it'll be, it'll come back. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't want to be in those shoes. But we need to remember that God gave us all good when he created us. And the, you know, the, the attitude of, the attitude of, of not having enough is really wrong. It's not faith in God. So prosperity is the normal, natural result of obedience to divine principle, and it should be welcomed and accepted and used for God's purpose. Not, not to get to where you worship the effect of God's goodness, but to remember that all good is from above. You know, there's something in Amos where he prophesies a famine, but it was the famine of not hearing the word of the Lord. There's a great lack of hearing his word and being able to follow it. So one of the aspects of prosperity is the prosperity of knowing our Father, hearing his direction, and willingly obeying him. There's that element of prosperity as well. Yeah, and I would say that the, the um, <clears throat> famine of not hearing God's word usually follows perhaps a, a real famine and um Matthew Henry says that uh, pestilence is God's messenger. When we don't, when we don't get it one way, we're going to get it some other way. And again, thinking about that Harriet story, all her oppression it led her to this tremendous faith in God. She was so much more blessed than the slave owners, wasn't she? She was the one blessed. Through all that hardship, she was the one blessed. Slave owners were not. And I do have to add, too, because my understanding is a lot of these slave owners did go to church. They, quote, were religious, unquote. But that also was brought out in this chapter. Amos, what good is it if you do all these things, if you don't live it? It's ever no good. That's May what they I were doing it? in Bethel, I guess, the hypocritical worship. <laughs> Who else was speaking? I wanted to share something at this point from what you just said about Harriet uh, being taken care of and 
supported by God because of her trust in him. And this is from uh, Matthew Henry under Amos 9.12, called by name. God marvelously preserves his elect amidst the most fearful confusions and miseries. When all seems desperate, he wonderfully revives his church and blesses her with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And great shall be the glory of that period in which not one good thing promised remained unfulfilled. End quote. Thank you. So, um, um, Bruce, I just want to say thank you for bringing that, that up about the famine. And Mary, okay. for talking about that. So that's in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Uh, where it talks about a famine of hearing of the word of the Lord, you know. And uh, it's so fascinating with so much is in here in Amos. In uh, chapter 4, verse 13, uh, Amos is telling us that God talks to us. But then if we don't listen to him, we won't hear him. But it's just great the way he puts this in there, you know. So uh, this is Amos chapter 4, verse 13, about God talking to us. And then uh, Amos um, chapter 8, verse 11, where if we turn away from God, there's going to be a famine of hearing of the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That is the great grave danger of a secular Secular life, secular nation. We need to heed the warnings in our in our lives individually when things go wrong, not to just think, oh, it's just something going wrong. No, these are warnings that you're off the path and you should be waking up. And it is certainly true as a nation. Well, you know, also uh, uh, makes me think, um, I was reading in uh, Amos, and um, I was a little bit surprised to find this. I mean, I think I read it before, but it just didn't sink in. But um, chapter 5, verse 26, it talks about the tabernacle of Moloch, which I had no clue what that was. But um, uh, does anybody, does that ring a bell with anybody in the current news these days about uh, the tabernacle of Moloch? <laughs> What I what I know about that is is that uh, and I could be mixing them in with the other uh, people that well not people but entities that were worshipped in that day but they all had this common thread where there was even human sacrifice involved and it was just a really corrupt and bloody um, system of worship. Right, this is an ancient god, uh, um, Canaanites and probably other people worshipped them, but it was uh, um, child sacrifice to the god of Moloch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the current news is that uh, there's a giant statue of Moloch that's put at the entrance at the Colosseum in Rome right now. So when you go to visit the Colosseum where they persecuted the Christians, you're going to see this big statue of Moloch uh, where they representing uh, child sacrifice. Yikes. Great. That is, that is just so evil because, and I'm not going to talk about it here, but if anybody cares to research it themselves, if you go to Dumelow's commentary, it will give you the uh, what those statues were all about, and it's not pretty. And, you know, that's what... Uh, these eight- and nine-month abortions now, what do you think that is? It's being made legal in various states. What is that? And also, Mary, you brought this up before about Amos and abortion. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. This one and, makes sense. So if you want to talk about it, but I mean, it's, Amos has so much in, in, what, in this book here. It's, it is amazing. Um, yeah, and I, what I remember reading was the, 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 the child sacrifice, the ones that were doing that, their punishment was the worst. 
And I, I thought, too, it was interesting. I read in a t- commentary, isn't it telling that the world is fine with the parts of the Bible that talk about love and joy and peace? But as soon as we start talking about sin and judgment and curse, they want to stop up their ears and tell us to stop speaking. And so the world doesn't want to hear God's word and they will hate us for it. But don't make it about us. Just be the messengers we are called to be. And this is why, too, I guess the Bible, you know, who wants to read this horrible stuff? But, but this is why we have to read it. Because what is shaping our rules and our laws today? We're becoming more and more secular when we allow this. I mean, it, it, it was unbelievable to me that these could be passed in various states. You know, it's, it is it's a killing of a child sacrificial killing of a child and it goes by as I don't know what I don't know how people could be so asleep to this it's okay and then we know it's the selling of the body parts some people are making a lot of money off of this so 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 the reference uh, on the abortion is uh Chapter 1, verse 13, um, it says, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have ripped up the women with child of Gilead. Uh, but I had no idea when I started reading Amos way back when we started this, uh, is that uh, it would be talking about what we just mentioned here in verse 13, about the Temple of Moloch, and oh, so many other things. You know? How do you spell that? The M-O-L-O-C-H. temple of what is it? M O L O C H. M O L O C H. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's actually uh, in different places spelled slightly differently. It has different ways of spelling it, but that's how it's spelled in Amos, like you said. M O L O C H. Sometimes it's M O L E C H, and there's other versions there, you know. And, and what was the chapter and verse that that was? So that was Amos chapter 5, verse 26. Mm-hmm. And Moloch was the ancient god of child sacrifice wow. and an idol of the Ammonites, a uh, Canaanite god. And there's actually a, a statue in Rome of him. It's, very, it's an exhibition, so it's not going to be there permanently, um, be there through March, I think. Um, but it, it's reminiscent of what we had uh, not too long ago about, um, was it the Statue of Baal that they put in cities, moved yeah. it around from city to city? Very similar think? in a way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Since, uh, since that's been brought up, so what, uh, exactly what I was not talking about was the child sacrifice. And it went so far as that the rich people, if they were supposed to sacrifice your firstborn or however many, um, so the rich people, what they would do is they would adopt kids so they wouldn't have to sacrifice their own. I mean, the whole thing is just so incomprehensible to me. That, and that goes back to the whole thing with um, the sacrifice of Isaac. So this was that false god that was that Molechian uh, um, god that Abraham was hearing. It was not the true god. It was saying to go sacrifice Isaac, and thankfully he heard the true God then, and it did not. But then he was putting himself at risk because he defied the norm, which was to go sacrifice your firstborn. Yeah. Hmm. That's why Abraham was such a prophet and leader, because he, he taught of the one true God. But he was the father of the Israeli nation. Effectively, because he was willing to think outside the box and listen to the real God instead of the All right, so we, you want to yeah. do any of these questions? <laughs> <laughs> one other thing well, in a way, I think we've been talking about Bethel and oppression of poor, and then maybe mm-hmm. before we move on, if there's just anybody who wanted to say anything on either one of those questions before we actually go on to the next one. Actually, yeah. I did because uh, what you mentioned about uh, Amos eight eleven about the famine, et cetera. But what leads up to that is that uh, uh, 
and far. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, and we may sell corn? The Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah, which is a measurement, small, and the shekel, great, falsifying the balances in deceit. So this is the uh, type of oppression that he, he was saying was going to lead into all the uh, bad things that were going to happen to the nation as a whole. Hmm. Well, it seems like if you're willing to sacrifice kids, then every bit of evil is on the table. Yeah. So. yeah, it doesn't get much worse than that. Um, one, I'd like to add something. This is, goes back to the slave owners, and uh, they were talking about they were going to church, but the one thing they did do was they brought Christianity, they, they um, gave Christianity to the slaves, and they took the right meaning of it and used it to their benefit. Hmm. Well, there you are, and that, that's what happens when you were under persecution and distress. It kind of chisels away all this ease and love of matter, you don't have that. So it's save Lord or I perish. On the additional gems page, we have that interview with Joe Carter about spirituals. And one of the things he says about the slaves and the slave masters was that the slaves were not impressed by the slave masters' Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all do. Well, you see, not one. <laughs> That's good. I think it was also said that they look at the slave owners and they could tell that they were not happy people. They were not at peace within. You couldn't be if you did that. How could you be? Yeah. Exactly. You know, there was a, a Disney movie that I love so much, and I, I don't know, I think for a while it was taken down because it's not politically correct, but it was it was called Song of the South. And, and Uncle Remus who was a, a, a black slave, I guess. He, he was the Christ figure in that movie. And as a, I thought for a child to see that, I mean, it left a huge impression on me because the slave owners were not, they were not this Christ expression. It was Uncle Remus. And yeah, maybe he wore um, overalls and maybe his speech wasn't perfect, but he did sing zippity doo da <laughs> and a lot of other really good songs. And I, I mean, I just grew up, I loved Uncle Remus and I would read all the stories I could about Uncle Remus. Um, so yeah, who, who is, who is the Christ image in these stories? Um, certainly not the slave owners. I read too, where with the Bethel illustration, Amos points out, that they were mistaken in believing that God was in this place and therefore their hope for life was a hollow one. They were assuming that simply because they were there, it would work in their favor. Amos mentions religious festivals, animal sacrifices, and music they believed to be glorifying to God, all indicating worship services of some kind. They went in for religion in a big way. Undoubtedly, they were wholeheartedly about it, so it was probably emotionally satisfying to them. But what good is worship if it does not get through to God? This is what Amos reveals to them. All their enthusiasm was for naught because their daily lives did not match God's standard, God's plumb line. So, and, and I do think, that's why Mrs. Eddy in our churches, what, there's no... Often decorations. The decorations. There's no um, rituals. She brings that out over and over in Science and Health. It's, it's your daily good deeds. Which is very impressive to me when I first came here. I mean, having come from a town that was 100% Catholic, and you know, every church, gaudy as can be, and they come in here and it's just simple and people are real. So. The other was just all show and totally unreal. Yeah, and the opposite of helpful. <laughs> I, I also think that um, in, in whatever way children are being sacrificed, maybe not the obvious way, but in certain ways, the slavery, child slavery that's going on 
yeah. in many parts of the world, that is really killing the souls of these children, whether they live or not. And so, yeah. you know, that's another form of it. Thank you. Thank you. A big form, my understanding is the sex trafficking, sex slave trafficking, taking these young children and, and woe be to that. You know, Christ Jesus speaks to that millstone around their necks. Um, woe be to that action. Every single one that's involved. And we need to know this daily because um, it is it's taking their souls. Thank you. But I think that it goes even further because uh, it is so unbelievable to me now how it's changed uh, from when I went to school. I had to run the farm, so I either did or did not do my homework, but it didn't take long. Whereas my poor daughter was up uh, till the mid, you know, through the middle of the night. I think that's a form of training them, and then uh, and then college was even worse. Uh, so. They're training these kids to be slaves to a system, in a way, because they're just dumping so much. You know, and everybody thinks that they've got to give them two hours worth of homework. It's just crazy. That's true. That's a good there's no no room. Right? There's no room for God in that. I mean, I, I'm sorry to say that, but they're too exhausted by the time they're just finishing the basics. Slaves to system. False education. Well, that's the secular society, isn't it? It used yeah. to be. It used to be as part of your entrance exam to get into a good college that you had to know a lot about the Bible. That's not on any entrance exam anymore to get into any college. The other uh, one, other point to make about Bethel, the name is was warning people don't go there that it's going to be destroyed it's going to be wiped out well Amaziah the priest of Bethel was attacking Amos wasn't he uh -huh. <laughs> he, he made up lies about Amos he spread lies to everybody that would listen to him he attacked the messenger And how often have we ever seen that happen? That's pretty relevant today. It's the first tool most most of the media reaches for it. Seems. <laughs> exactly. You got a lot of a lot of a lot of lie creating going on. <laughs> so it makes it challenging for us. You know, when we listen to whatever we listen to, ask the question, is this truth or is it a lie? But I think, uh, too, with the visual media, it's so much easier because I grew up without a TV and without any time to attend to anything like that. But today it's fascinating watching these people being questioned and you can tell when they're lying. Because you see their expressions, and, and uh, you can tell who's telling the truth to a certain degree just by watching their uh, body language. Well, we have to trust our spiritual sense. That's for sure. Because otherwise, we're otherwise it could be very confusing. And and you have to know the Bible and and science and health, the rules, and take it back uh, to that. The plumb line. That's right. Only the plumb line. Only God knows who's telling the truth. So, yeah. That's why our prayers are impersonal in that respect. God knows. This reminded me of that movie Shattered Glass about the man that oh, right. kept making up news stories. And it was in a newspaper that they prided themselves on not having pictures. It was just all, you know, text. So at the end, the receptionist said to the editor, you know, what would, would have prevented all this is pictures of the person you're interviewing because they were all made up people. <laughs> that was a very good movie for today. It was just an old movie, but this guy, and it's with this 24-7 news going on, 
I mean, this guy learned just to make up all these fake stories and they were selling and, and interesting and, but they were all lies and, and nobody, nobody knew, nobody checked him. Um, <laughs> and it's rampant today. It's rampant today. I mean, hello. Uh, it's what Linda, what did, was it Linda that started out the bearing false witness um, with that statement that no one seems to care anymore if you tell a lie? It's, it's almost like it's accepted. That's where we go back. It's not accepted. It is disobeying God's law. There's a plumb line, and I don't care who you are and what you're lying about, but don't. <laughs> It'll come yeah, back. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and oh. Matthew Henry, about Amos 7, he says, It is no new thing for the accusers of the brethren to misrepresent them as enemies to the king and kingdom as traitors and troublers of the land when they are the best friends to both. That is wonderful. What was that one again? I... That was uh, Matthew Henry's oh. concise uh, commentary for Amos 7. Amos 7. Well, thank you. And um, I just want to mention something which uh, kind of about our Bible studies for all those who are listening. That, uh, is that uh, when you read through... Um, uh, the Bible for our Bible study, and you see something that is intriguing or you don't quite understand it. Uh, uh, one thing you can do is go to the website Bible, Bible Hub and just read the commentary. Um, so, Jeremy, I don't know if you went there for Matthew Henry, but um, in Bible Hub, they will have Matthew Henry there that's associated with the verse, you know? So, thank you. Um, Hello? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, this is Ingrid in Los Angeles. Thank you so much, you guys, for all the work. I just would like to um, bring this up, uh, all this great talk about human sacrifices, and thank you for bringing it up. And there's another sacrifice that is more subtle and hidden, that is the sacrifice of the creatures of God. And you've been talking about great movies, and I just want to share. There's a new great um, movie that is called A Prayer for Compassion. I am actually screening it today in a public venue, and uh, it's all related to how these sacrifice, you know, the billions of creatures of God just for pleasure and for nutrition and whatever we call it makes such a difference in humanity and is really causing us by killing, which we're not supposed to do. And uh, I just I just really wanted to bring that. It's called A Prayer for Compassion, a uh, very wonderful thing for us to pray with. Thank you so much for all your good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very true. Very true. The way we treat animals is very indicative of a society. So, Tom, where are we? It comes with all these. Well, I I, I wanted to say that uh, I'm going to repeat what I said before because. We talk about a lot of things here, um, slavery and so forth, that can be kind of depressing, as we've been talking about, oppressing the poor, you know. Um, But uh, we can't be depressed, okay? So go back to Amos chapter 4, verse 13, where it talks about, uh, you know, God declareth unto man, man what his thought is. So God talks to us, all right? Um, And... uh, I thought then we would just, we could touch on, we're almost at the end, but if, um, uh, this is a very positive thing. So what does it mean to be called by his name? Amos chapter 9, verse 12. So, so much of this with Amos, you know, he comes from the southern kingdom, goes to the northern kingdom. Everything seems to be about, you know, uh, the Hebrews, the Jews, Israel, Israelites, whatever you call them, you know, their kingdom. But then you read this, and you say, oh, is this just about the Israelites? So what do you think? Someone can read it. 
Well, uh, it says, starting with verse 11, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Well, I read that the possessed the remnant of Eden, I think this was Matthew Henry, that is, that the Christ may have given him for his inheritance even the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. And of course, so what is it to be called by his name? To belong to God. Yes. To, to come in his power, in his authority. And in the end, everybody belongs to God, no? Yes, everybody. Everyone has that ability. So David came to Goliath in the name of the Lord Almighty. Coming in that name, woe be to anybody who tried to oppose when you come in that name, but of course, and to come in that name, yeah, you have to understand you belong to him and you are an expression of him and living up to that expression. Otherwise, believe me, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. That's what we talked about before about that, what Bruce brought up, the famine of hearing the word of God. But we turn towards him and we're all included. Yes. Wherever we came from, whoever we are. We turn to God, and we're all included. This is very, very inclusive. You can kind of see why Martin Luther King liked the quote from the book of Amos. Yeah. Well, and, and also the idea of being called. God calls all of us to fulfill a divine purpose. He does call all of us. Amen. It's not that like some people are called and some people aren't. But I think the way this is used here, those who are called by his name are those that accept God's call to, and are willing to fulfill their divine purpose, are willing to accept it and see it. They know they've been called. There are some people who just don't know yet that they're being called for a divine purpose. And so they're confused. They're trying to live out some human destiny without God. But That's God. why the message of all being important to God and God, you know, loving everyone is important to spread because when the wrong message is given, then people, you know, don't understand what this loving God is that we have that is here for all mankind. Yes. That's right. Get it out to everyone and correct the uh, mis misinformation. And, 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 of course, Christ Jesus says that the um, sheep hear my voice, right? Mm -hmm. I will listen for thy voice, lest my footsteps stray. It's within all of us to hear God's voice, every one of us. And many in the worst conditions, as in the case of Harriet, she heard him very clearly. People, people backed off when they heard her talk. They knew there was something mighty about her. They couldn't argue with it. It was, it was God. She had been called by his name, and she answered that call without fear and without hesitation. She didn't blame him for what people did. <laughs> no, she did not. She never blamed him. Blame God. And it's not, a, it's not a matter of what church you go to. It's not a matter of what country you live in. It's not a matter of the color of your skin or the color of your hair or kind of house you live in. It, it doesn't, none of that matters. It is universal. And sometimes. Thank you so much. 
sometimes the Christ message comes to us from places that we would least expect it. So we right. open. Thank you so much for bringing this thought because it does so much about the chosen, you know, how oh, the soul of how that's so much chosen and so much not. And mm-hmm. this is such a wonderful thing to bring up. It's all of us are chosen to listen to God and to serve God. So thank you for bringing that. That's a good point. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah. There's not just a few chosen and all the rest standing on the outside. We're all chosen of God. We're all called if we if we heed his voice. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the choosing is on our part, not God's part. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It couldn't be infinite if anyone was left out. So Gary, it's true. You you leave you you stay out. And especially sometimes when you really don't know this good God. So you have to our prayers are for everyone that they might know him. Thank you. In uh, researching Hallowed Be Thy Name, I came up, uh, found somewhere a very nice explanation of that. that Name also means character, so knowing God's name is knowing his beautiful, perfect, uh, loving character. Mm -hmm. I thought this also went along with learning to trust your spiritual sense and see that God is God, and he's good, and he loves you. Yep. Yep. And this is it. He starts the textbook. Ignorance is no longer the stepping stone, is it? <laughs> yeah. It's the wrong understanding of him. That. Yeah. We we have to we we have to have some kind of understanding of the nature of God, in order to know what it is that we should be obedient to. So I thank God for signs and help. I thank God for the Bible and prose works, our textbooks. And thank God for this Bible study. Yes, thank yeah. God and thank, <laughs> God. thank you very much. Mom, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So, and everybody oh, thank you, everybody, thank you, for Tom. joining in and reading Amos. And thank you. Well, will we have another one for Amos? Thank you. This seems to be more we could go through. We could. We could do that. You can have one more. It's so relevant. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll see okay. you. Okay. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.